guys went around doing an acute kidney um, injury, injury as our presentation topic, and it's um, Annalise, Natalie, Hannah, and myself. So for our case study, we've decided to make um, a man called Benjamin Wheelers, who's a 67-year-old male who lives with his wife in a small unit in Oakley. He's currently undergoing treatment for hypoglycemic episode at Monash Hospital. During his stay, Ben began presenting with symptoms of an acute kidney infection, which has been recently diagnosed, and he's currently receiving treatment for that. Ben previously smoked half a packet of cigarettes a day for 12 years, however, he's not smoked in 10 years. And he also consumes the occasional alcohol beverage when surrounded by friends and family, but he doesn't drink in excess. Ben has recently retired from being a plumber and lives at home with his wife. His daughter regularly visits to help him and his wife, however, they're not needed, as they're both pretty independent with their ADLs. Um, since retirement, Ben enjoys regular walks with his wife and throughout his life has been diagnosed with hypertension, type 2 diabetes, which is managed through his diet, and he's been recently diagnosed with hyperglycemia. So partnering with consumers is a framework that ensures that the patient is centred, sorry, that the care is centred to the patient, that they are involved in every step of their care regime, and feel empowered to make decisions in regards to that care. The standard also focuses on educating the patient in respect to the care that they are receiving and the options they may have. It promotes the patient independence and in an effort to improve their future health outcomes. As Ben is our patient, we need to be aware of his concerns regarding his care plan. and we need to involve him as much as possible so he is able to continue his care and maintain it at home as he's independent. We need to teach him his medications, what they're doing, how they care of himself, if he experiences any changes in his health and what adverse effects his treatment may um, produce. Um, we need to also provide him with an opportunity to gain or further any knowledge you'd like in regards to his medical conditions. And we need to be mindful that Ben is more than just a patient with AKI or Ben 6, and we need to think of him as a whole person to tailor his care to his individual needs. So, pathophysiology. AKI is a complex disorder with multiple definitions. Formerly, it was known as acute kidney failure. It's described as a rapid decrease in kidney function usually measured by an increase in serum creatine. Glomerular filtration rate refers to the flow rate of filtered fluid through the kidneys, and an inverse relationship exists between serum creatine and GFR. A small increase in serum creatine represents a substantial decline in glomerular filtration rate. AKI is most common in acute hospitalised patients with a generalised incident range of 27%. Despite medical advances, AKI continues to be associated with high morbidity and mortality, with mortality rates exceeding 50% in the intensive care unit. It is being associated with a high risk of exacerbating or developing chronic kidney disease. Some common risk factors for AKI are an age of over 65 years, 60 years sorry, a sepsis diagnosis, diabetes mellitus, heart disease, exposure to nephrotoxic drugs, volume depletion, or an underlying kidney insufficiency. Most patients with moderate to mild AKI are asymptomatic and are usually identified through laboratory testing. However, severe cases may present with listlessness, confusion, fatigue, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, weight gain on a deep, or abnormal urine output. Lubria is less than 400 mL per day, and anuria is less than 100 mL per day. However, patients with AKI can have normal urine outputs. They may also suffer from new breathing encephalopathy, manifested by a decline in mental status, asteroxis, or neurological symptoms anemia or bleeding caused by platelet dysfunction. Other symptoms which are less common but more generalised include bloody stools, burnt odour and metallic taste in the mouth, bruising easily, changes in mental status or mood, a decreased appetite, decreased sensation, especially in the hands or feet, flank pain between the ribs and the hands, hand tremors, high blood pressure, nose bleeds, persistent hiccups, seizures, shortness of breath, slow sluggish movements, or swelling due to the body keeping in fluid. AKI is classified into three cause categories, pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal. Pre-renal kidney injury is caused by a hyperperfusion of the kidneys, 
which is most likely due to volume depletion from burns, hemorrhage or gastrointestinal losses, hypertension from sepsis or shock, or renal artery stenosis, which is a narrowing of renal arteries. Some vasoactive medications can also cause pre-renal kidney injury by producing intrarenal vasoconstriction, leading to hyperperfusion of the glomerular. Possible complication medications include angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, epinephrine, high dose dopamine or angiotensin receptor antagonists. The kidneys receive 20 to 30 percent of all cardiac output. This blood supply is required to remove wastes and manage fluid and electrolyte balance. The glomerular filtration rate drops if the blood flow is reduced. This decreases urine output and filtration and reabsorption of substances. The glomerular capillaries receive blood from the afferent arteriole and the blood exits to the efferent arteriole. The location between the arterioles maintains the pressure necessary to move fluid through the capillaries. This maintains the glomerular filtration rate. The arterioles are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system and are sensitive to vasoactive substances. Kidney blood flow is affected by the sympathetic nervous system simulation and when exposed to vasoactive drugs <coughs> or drugs. Damage to the tubular cells can occur when kidney blood flow reaches approximately 20% of normal. Intrinsic kidney injury involves the structural damage of glomerulus, vessels, or kidney tubules. This is often brought on by prolonged pre-renal causes, leading to cell necrosis or ischemia, or by infectious agents and toxins that result in inflammation or injury. The most common forms of intrinsic kidney injury are acute tubular necrosis, acute interstitial nephritis, and contrast-induced nephropathy. Acute tubular necrosis is the most common cause of intrinsic kidney injury. It usually occurs after an ischemic or toxic ATN event. Ischemic ATN is caused by pre-renal azotemia, which is high levels of nitrogen, or sepsis, which is a blood infection. Toxic ATN is caused by direct tubular damage by nephrotoxins, such as aminoglycosides, glycosides, or radiocontrast agents. Renal ischemia results from a generalised or localised impairment of oxygen and nutrient delivery to and waste, removal, waste product removal from cells of the kidney. There is a mismatch of local tissue oxygen supply and demand and accumulation of waste products or, waste products or metabolism. This imbalance causes the tubular epithelial cells to undergo injury and if it is severe, death by hypothesis, which is cell suicide and necrosis with organ impairment of water and electrolyte homeostasis and reduced excretion of waste products of metabolism. In ATN, necrotic tubular epithelial cells begin to slough off and lead to tubular obstruction and back leak of filtrate through the damaged epithelium. This obstruction causes increased pressure on the system, decreasing glomerular filtration rate and contributing to afferent arterial constriction. This decreases glomerular capillary filtration. Tubular injury is frequently reversible if, if damage is not severe enough to cause cortical necrosis. Post-renal kidney injury is an obstruction, is caused by obstruction from kidney calculi, blood clots, benign prostatic hypertrophy, malignancies, and pregnancies. <coughs> These obstructions cause injury by increasing the pressure within the kidney collecting system. This results in a drop in glomerular filtration rate, decreased water and sodium reabsorption, and phosphaturia. In the broader sense, kidney acute kidney injury is simply, is simply the rapid decline in renal filtration, which is a decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Previously, clinical diagnosis heavily relied on a change in serum creatine levels as a surrogate for the change in GFR. In 2004, the Acute Dialysis Qualitative Initiative Group developed a consensus, consensus definition for AKI. A decrease in glomerular filtration rate of more than 25% or an increase in serum creatine of 50% was deemed sufficient to diagnose AKI. However, it has since been discovered that a 50% increase of creatine is actually equivalent to two-thirds decrease in glomerular filtration rate. As a result, diagnosis is often the process of elimination 
combined with testing and investigation of biomarkers. Three factors have emerged as likely determinant biomarkers, which will contribute to a successful diagnosis or prediction of decline in renal function. These include a likely etiology of AKI, pre-existing renal function, or the time from renal insult. Renal replacement therapy for AKI generally involves intermittent hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy. This increased vasodilation leads to an improvement in the glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so pharmacology. Okay, so the medication that Ben was taking before coming to hospital was paracetamol and ibuprofen for pain relief when required. He was also taking vitamin D and a multivitamin in the morning. Um, okay, so as Ben's acute kidney injury was caused by hypertension, the pharmacological management is to treat his hypertension, hypotension, sorry. Uh, this will be achieved with an antihypertensive. Okay, so the class of drug that Ben will receive is a sympathetic adrenergic agonist. Um, this class of drug mimics the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. There are three types, um, alpha-specific, beta-specific, and an alpha and beta adrenergic agonist. So he will be treated with an alpha and beta adrenergic agonist called ephedrine. Um, so ephedrine has both a direct and indirect mechanism of action. It stimulates the release of more adrenaline from its storage site that then stimulates both the alpha and beta adrenergic receptor sites, and this produces a physiological effect associated with sympathetic stimulation. So this will increase his vasoconstriction and cardiac output, which then increases his uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, so epigen is contraindicated in patients with uh, angle coma because it can exacerbate the condition. Ephedrine can have adverse effects such as hypertension, angina, arrhythmia due to its effect on the sympathetic nervous system. So it's important to monitor heart rate and blood pressure. It can also uh, have an adverse effect of nausea and constipation because it depresses the gastrointestinal system. Um, some other medications that interact with ephedrine are beta blockers as they inhibit the effect and alpha blockers that the pre can decrease the effect. Also, Ben should avoid the use of caffeine as it can increase the effects and this can lead to hypertension. Um, it is also important to educate Ben on the avoidance of nephrotoxic agents. Um, so in Ben's case, this is his use of ibuprofen for pain relief. Um, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can cause inflammation within the renal tissue and papillary necrosis. So it's important to inform Ben to avoid using it as a pain relief and also, oh, sorry, and also to consult his GP before taking any non-prescription medication. Medication safety is ensuring and supporting organisations that have regulations in place regarding the safe prescribing, dispensing, supplying, administering, storing, manufacturing and compounding of medications. Um, it ensures that the patient's medication history is available to all healthcare professionals that contribute to the care of the patient and ensures that the patient is monitored for any adverse reactions from the medication. Um, it also ensures that the patient knows what they're taking and why they're taking it, what the adverse reactions are. It also helps the patient know what the risks associated with the medication and the responsibilities when taking the medication is. Um, whether they want the tablets whole if they can be crushed or if they can be taken in liquid form. Um, why is this relevant to Ben? Well, Ben's taking a small collection of medication while receiving healthcare, medication that needs to be written up and um, charted so that all the healthcare professionals are on board with what he's taking and what the um, potential um, interactions could be. Um, it also means that the medications that Ben is taking that are newly prescribed um, need to be checked that are not nephrotoxic because they can prefer prevent they aren't. Um, and with the new medication, they need to become informed of what they are and what they do to his body if he should expect to feel any different or if there'll be any changes in his lifestyle. Um, then he's independent at home, so he needs to um, receive new medications with an education of what they look like and what they will do to him so that he knows how to counteract and take care of himself when it happens. Okay, so that's the investigations. Investigations that may be performed on Benjamin include an MRI scan of his kidneys to test 
test any changes in the shape of the kidney, of the kidney as well as the urinalysis to test for any changes in this urine significant to acute kidney injury. Monitor hypertension. Because Benjamin's acute injury is caused by hypertension, it is important to firstly obtain a baseline blood pressure, so that as we monitor his blood pressure, we can compare his readings to the original to ensure that any medication he has put on is actually working. And on top of that, we need to make sure that he has an understanding of what hypertension is and how it has influenced his current condition. Uh, monitor fluids and electrolytes. Due to the decreased function of Benjamin's kidneys, he is at a much higher risk of fluid imbalances and increased levels of electrolytes. We will need to um, closely monitor his fluid input and output by keeping an accurate fluid balance chart, as his kidneys will not be filtering the fluids at the normal rate. More importantly, however, Benjamin's kidneys will not be filtering electrolytes properly, and the most relevant being potassium. When too much potassium is retained in the bloodstream, hypercholemia occurs. This could potentially be a major concern due to the fact that um, it can, high, high level of potassium in the blood can lead to arrhythmias of the heart. Um, this is why it's essential to monitor all of Benjamin's food and fluid intakes, making sure that he does not ingest any unnecessary potassium in his diet. Um, reduce potassium release. We want to reduce what, any potassium that is released in Benjamin's body. And in order to do this, we will need to try and reduce his metabolic rate. Um, any reaction involving the breakdown of proteins needs to be slowed, and this, as this can result in more potassium being released, which can lead to a hypercholemia. Um, what we can do to help slow Benjamin's metabolism is promote bed rest and more relaxing activities and reduce strenuous or demanding activities where possible. Um, minimize the risk of infection. Uh, the reason we want to do this is um, infection can increase metabolism, which again, is a problem with potassium in the blood. But however, uh, this shouldn't really be a problem for Benjamin as he is a relatively healthy man and has no issues concerning infection. However, should a procedure need to be done where infection is a risk, we will need to remember that to keep everything sterile as possible. And then lastly, patient and family education. As with all patients, it's vital to make sure that Benjamin fully understands what's going on with his condition, that his family also needs to be informed. <coughs> The purpose of this is to reduce stress in the patient and his family and also to help him make informed decisions and necessary life changes in relation to his acute kidney injury. Yeah, recognising and responding to clinical deterioration in acute healthcare is the ability of healthcare professionals to identify the signs and respond to a deteriorating patient and to educate the patient's family and carers to be able to also recognise any signs of deterioration to help contribute to the patient's care. This is relevant to Bennett's who has developed an acute kidney infection while at hospital and if the staff were unable to detect the deterioration in his presentation of symptoms, he would not have had early intervention and treating of the new condition, therefore potentially resulting in further cell damage and lifelong complications. The injury Ben may have sustained to his kidneys could have been more advanced had the signs not been analysed by staff and rather than early sustaining uh, pre-renal injury, Ben could have sustained an intrinsic renal injury or pre